Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Project. Today we have a special guest, Mike Loomis. Mike is the founder of MDL Companies, a vertically integrated real estate firm based in Bay City, Michigan, with five divisions, including investments, construction, property management, realty, and insurance restoration. He has flipped around 400 single family homes, completed around 190 land contract sales, and 80 lease option finances. We currently use MDL to manage our 52 unit portfolio in Saginaw. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Duke. I'm very honored to be a part of this. Um, I have to say, I've listened to all the podcasts, at least I think I have, and I've really enjoyed them. And I think this is a great service to the real estate community. So for those who aren't familiar, can you share what you do and what you're working on now? Well, as you said, uh, we have five different divisions. So I, uh, at this point, manage the managers and um, we're buying some properties over in a local town, Midland, where they had a, a huge um, flood from a dam breaking. So I'm buying, uh, I guess, other people's uh, properties that have been destroyed and I'm going to put them back together. So that's projects I'm doing. When we're done with this, I'm going to drive over there and look at one and buying right now. So are you buying those from the people directly or is it from like the banks or everybody? I'm buying them directly from the people at this point. Nice. So what is your why for building passive cash flow? My why for buying for building passive cash flow, I would say that um, I got I got a degree in psychology and I uh, I prior to that I read a book in college, Mark Harrison's book on buying real estate, fixing it up, and selling it, and it just hit me. It was kind of like um, I kept my destiny to do real estate. And I just, I loved it. When I got out, I started, I, I got some um, money from my grandparents alone and I got started buying and the opportunities were good at that time in my area. And I could buy with seller financing. So I was able to, I got about $40,000 from my grandparents and I was able to compound that leverage of that into um, a large, for me, for myself, for a portfolio of real estate. And I just never looked back once I got started. I never got my uh, my, so my master's degree in, in counseling. I stayed with it. And I just, I like being my own boss. I like having my own control and creating things. So I guess that would be my why. And I like giving money away. I have a couple of charities that I really enjoy giving money to. That's awesome. What charities? Nice. Uh, there are two youth camps. So there's one in uh, Michigan and one in California that I give money to. Um, and I, 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 I have three sons, so I'm interested in the youth and I've enjoyed being a part of giving my time and my resources. It's amazing. So um, how did you scale from flipping to the five divisions that you currently have at MDL? Oh, I started in 86. So uh, <laughs> That that was a, a scenario that I, I guess Duke I would say started in the meltdown of 2008 and realizing that I needed needed to diversify and I needed more more areas of, of focus so that um, like restoration for an example it's more recession proof I think property management is the same more recession proof. And so I started having the opportunity to develop them. And then my sons wanted to come into the business, which again caused me the, the need to expand. And it was just hard work and bringing in the right people and giving them the proper incentive. So it, it has been fun to watch, something that I would have never thought when I started back in 86, that I would, I would be in this situation so with the size just, of the company. So what made you decide to build out all the different arms instead of just sticking to one of them? Well, I've got people that have different skill sets that I, I was able to bring into the company. And again, it stabilizes it. it. Instead of just one leg on a stool, I guess I would say I've got five legs now. And I've gone through some hard times. I mean, real estate, I love it. It's been a great avenue for me to make a, a career and, and to do well in. But it has its ups and downs. And this allows me to kind of smooth out the ride more. And this COVID situation we have now there's aspects of it. Well, as I mentioned, the floods, and we're doing some work on our restoration division for well, about 10 different investors and um, individuals. You guys are one of them. And so that able, while we can't collect from our governor and they, or evict anyone, we can make income on this other avenue. That's great. So where do you see MDL heading next? 
Well, I've got to brag on the uh, younger generation. The uh, baby boomers have done a lot of hard work, but the uh, Generation Y, Generation X, I don't know what we're calling them now, but they're the ones that are really helping me lead this. And so we have leadership meetings every other Tuesday and talk about our future and where we're wanting to, to take it. And I can see myself continually developing these divisions with our managers taking the lead more and more. So I'm going to say, Duke, in the past, I would set one and five-year goal. I don't know where it's going to go to now. I'm starting to think I can't think big enough when I can leverage off real estate and off other people's talent that are really committed to what we're doing. So I'm excited to say, I don't know. And I'm going to say the sky's the limit at this point. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty incredible that um, you built these five companies that are and one thing uh, for, for our listeners that, so Mike had built these companies and they're all not just family owned, but family operated. Like he, he mentioned his sons, but it's not just the the two sons. He also has like nephews working and everything that you see the picture on his website. There's like 10 of them, it seems like that are all working part of the various aspects in the company. So what are the pros and cons of having a family owned and operated versus just being able to hire out? Because being able to fire your son would probably be a little harder than just firing another man that you you hire um so how does that like what are the like some of the uh you know the, the differences in being family owned and operated well i'll give you some of the positives first and we'll move to the negative uh, the positive is um, I can trust them. Secondly, I, I one of my goals in life, other than real estate, was to, to drive deep down three to four generations in my family and to affect and see positive effects, hopefully, with my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And so that's been one of my focuses, and real estate allowed me the time to do that. So I, I, I didn't work that hard over a lot of years early on. I spent time with family because real estate treated me well. And so they've been trained to think the way I think and to think bigger than I think, really. And so they understand the five divisions better than most people, for sure. I have a couple managers that get it. And the other thing I would say is they, because they have the same last name, they have to prove themselves maybe even harder. Uh, the flip side of it, I would say, is, yeah, we have to be careful when we go home. This is Fourth of July weekend. We're going to go up north. We have certain lines. We're not talking business anymore. This yep. is just fun. And the business we deal, we deal with in our company. And whoever has the expertise or the position in a division, they're the lead in that. And we respect and follow those um, people's responsibilities and decisions, even if it's the younger brother telling the elder one. So we try to follow lines in the company and structure. Nice. I'll also give him the rope to make mistakes as well. I find it's big when you're dealing with uh, people because you can just tell employee like that's not going to work. You're not going to do it this way. But sometimes these are just give them that little bit of the rope and let them see for themselves, uh, come to their that own conclusion themselves by, you know, failing a little bit and then like see, see this is what I was talking about. And then now they can see the bigger picture and grow from from that experience. So that is uh, awesome. So with your five companies, uh, Duke already hit on uh, what was the did you have a vision starting these companies and you did? In, uh, back in 19, was it 86? Um, so now that you're here, uh, my question, I guess, would be what one is your favorite of the five companies or, or most profitable? The one that's the most profitable eventually will be the insurance restoration division, I believe. My most favorite is the, the, the NDL investments arm where we buy real estate. I have I don't know how many, maybe a thousand properties I bought and sold, um, but I never get tired of that. When we're done with our interview, I'm driving over the middle and look at this deal that I think I got, and um, I think it's a great return, over 100%, and I just, I just enjoy that. It's, it's in my blood. It's in my DNA. So I would say the investment arm. Nice. Investment arm is the favorite. I'm writing that down. All right. So there's a couple things that you mentioned that I just want to uh, just touch on just to, if the listeners didn't catch on it. So when in this business, the, the a lot of people that we talk to, when, when it comes to scaling, they scale for efficiency, not for diversity. And I think that is a huge, huge point that you made that I really haven't heard uh, anywhere um, is a lot of people say, for example, creating a property management company, they create a property management company at a certain point in their portfolio, because the efficiencies of bringing that with in house will be cheaper than continuing to hire a third party. And that normally happens around uh, 800 to 1000 units is when you have a portfolio of 800,000 units, that's when it usually crosses the line of, okay, okay, it makes sense to start my own company and manage from within because uh, it'll be cheaper that way in the long run. You did it with a different perspective and a different uh, lens, which is to stabilize your stream, uh, your multiple streams of income 
and diversify uh, those those streams of income as well. Like you, like you said, you have five five pegs holding up the the stool or the the table instead of just one. So having these industries that are all still within you know the real estate kind of umbrella, but feeding the that core investment company with very diverse uh, aspects like restoration company versus uh, property management versus your brokerage account are, are pretty diverse, and they they have different. Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Different demands, uh, different things in the economy is going to drive those different demands. So one one event that brings down one side of the economy is not going to generally be across the board, which is going to let lend to that stabilization and diversity. Like you said, you've gotten through some pretty tough times by having those diverse companies. So I just want to make uh, that point that if anybody didn't catch that, that it's very important to not just scale for efficiency, but scale out for uh, stabilization as well. So that is yeah. awesome. Whether you intentionally did that or not, that, that's awesome awesome when you were building these. I'd like to add a little bit more to my thought on that. I, everything you said, I agree. Um, I reached my goal in about the early 2000s. I started in 86 and I, I was kind of coasting at that point, generating income. I did a lot of private financing and, and rentals and I would do some flip homes and I, and I thought everything was good. And then I would listen in, through the mid 2000s. I like golf. And I would watch the golf shows and, and the advertisements and they would talk about, are you ready for retirement? And I'm like, yes, I am. I got it all covered. And, and uh, I, I was feeling very confident. And then something came along that I had no control over. And that was 2008. And it blew it all apart on me. And I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't over leverage. And I was still part of the game. I, and that was years recovering from that. Mm -hmm. And I said, next time, that's not going to happen to me. And that was one of the driving factors in doing what I did. Because after 30, about 34 years now, there are going to be bumps. There's going to be situations that you can't control. And I'm doing this till I die. I don't plan on retiring. So the stabler it is, which is more divisions, the better. Nice. Absolutely. So our relationship um, started with the property management uh, side of the house. So speaking on uh, now it's restoration as well, but we'll cover that later. So uh, with property management, um, what is some of your your favorite uh, things that you you've implemented that either well, you know the property management KPIs like uh, increases in occupancy, decreases in vacancy, economic occupancy, like things like that. What are some of the techniques that you have in your companies that um, you think is a competitive advantage uh, in the way you manage properties? I'll give you a couple. Um, one recently has been bringing on a young nephew of mine, Drew Loomis, who's done a phenomenal job. And he's using a software called um, Appfolio. And that has really uh, given us just a lot of um, management ability and power to, to market in ways that we couldn't before through the internet. And like 52 different uh, websites that it expands out to for filling vacancies. And that happens much faster than then the old days when I would put it in the newspaper and they would call me and come look, everything could be virtual now. The signing of the lease, the payment of the money. So that really allows scale. The investor that you're managing for has a porthole to know everything that's going on. It, it just is, it's been a really good move. Going back in time, I would say um, in our area, for whatever reason, they don't allow you to charge late fees. And that's a, a pretty good revenue stream when you compound that over, you know, if you got seven, um, three, 400 units. And so what we did was we offered the rent, we would increase the rent 50 or $75, whatever we, we wanted the late fee to be. And say, if you pay by say the fifth of the month, we'll give you a discount. And so when we would take that to the court system, they would, they would allow that. They would throw out all the late fees prior to that. And so that was a nice revenue stream. So it was just being a little creative and it created a positive for the tenant. And instead of saying, no, we got you, it's the sixth of the month. Now you're paying an extra $50. We just reversed it and said, you, if you pay by the fifth or earlier, we're going to discount you, which is a mental shift. Yeah. But it, it generates quite a bit of revenue over the years. Yeah, that's never, never heard of that. But like you said, it gives them the, the incentive to, to pay you first. Um, so that is in a positive way. Yeah, exactly. Pos positive reinforcement, positive incentive. That that is uh, um, really uh, incredible. Actually, I just took note of that. I've never heard of that before. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some some of my feedback for for specifically Drew and with uh, for for the listeners things that when you're interviewing um, property management companies is the the property managers' um, willingness to listen to you 
and and what your your goals are, what your ideas are, what your strategy is. Because uh, I've dealt with four or five property managers now, um, and over over my career, probably seven. And there's a lot of them that are just stuck in their ways, and they're they have a certain way of doing things, and they're not willing to learn anything new or you know innovate or any of that. And and Drew has been on board with all of our crazy ideas, like virtual showings and all that stuff. And uh, you know, it, it, it's been awesome having Drew on the team. Uh, you know, being being part of the team, actually listening and uh, feeling free to uh, give his input as well and come up with uh, solutions that are better than both of our individual ideas uh, together. So that has been huge uh, value added to to our team. All right. So in your bio, the uh, Duke had mentioned federal court receiverships, and I have never heard of this. So uh, can you explain what the federal court receiverships are? Well, I'm sure that's wider than what I understand, but the area that I functioned in that was a a local investor who had a publicly traded company. He had probably 120 people who had bought into it and he was doing things illegal. And so the SEC came in and along with the, um, I I, I think that uh, the SEC is along with with the FBI and took control of that. So they they, they arrested him and took him in custody and went through the process of the court system, which takes a long time. So at that point, the court system, which was the federal courts, give a re- hire a receiver, and the receiver is an attorney that works directly for the court system. Well, they don't directly manage the property. The property still need to be rented and uh, utilities paid and snow removed. So they hired our company to be the property manager. So we worked for them. That is awesome. How long does the that timeline normally take? Because I, I would imagine it's pretty much in the court system for for years, right? I would imagine it's not something that quickly happens. No, uh, we're still in the process of that, uh, managing properties for them. Not as many now. We sold off most of them. We worked as their realtor as well. But even when they found this person guilty and they sent him to jail for prison for 20 years, the receiver still managed these properties until they saw the best avenue to sell them to maximize profit. So it's probably been seven years, six years that we've been in that position with the um, court system. And I've had to go in front of the federal judge and give our reports and what we've done. And there are people there talking, you know, crying because they've they've been taken advantage of. So it's been a heavy responsibility and something that we, um, I guess I'll brag about us a little bit. We've done a good job and they were very pleased with it. And the SEC mentioned that as well. So it, it, it was fun to do to offer value to someone else. And they treated us well financially as well. That is awesome to have that that niche. I've, I've never, like I said, we, we've never heard about it. I've read it five minutes before we jumped on the call. And that is a huge, I, I would think that's a huge market to play in um, or to be in to provide that that uh, that service. Two things, like same thing with banks, right? So a bank takes over uh, a foreclosure. They're not property managers. Like you take over, you know, portfolio or apartment complex or something like that, um, or it gets, you know, repoed and they're not going to manage it. So they having you providing that service being on their, their Rolodex, uh, to all the, all the banks and all the, the core stuff would be huge for the company as well. We manage for multiple banks. One of them, I think it's been 10 years. So we do the property management, then we do the sales and we do the heavy construction for them. And so it's been nice. We've nice. enjoyed it. That is awesome. So switching gears here. So as an investor, um, what is your favorite thing to do to like increase uh, income or decrease in expenses? Do you have like one thing that every time you buy an asset is like your go-to thing to you know bump up the the income or, or decrease expenses? Um, you can't use the late reverse late fees. You already said that one. Can't use the what? The the reverse late fees that you were talking about earlier. <laughs> Um, well, for me, a lot of the core of my business has been buying homes and fixing them up and selling them. And my insurance policy was if I couldn't sell it, I would rent it. And so I would, along that line, I've done rent with an option to buy. And that way they become responsible for any of the repairs because the private financing, the sale of something, um, and carry back finance. We do a lot of land contracts as well. Mm-hmm. So those two avenues I found where I don't have to handle any of the repairs, uh, any of the lawn care, no emergency calls. It's all on them, but still have ownership and I could take it back if they don't perform. And then they'll put five, six percent down as a down payment for the right to have that option. I've cycled some properties multiple times using that and they fail on their own and I take it back and, re- and re-rent it. So in the single family game, I have found that to be an avenue to really boost up, turbo boost the returns. Absolutely. That's um, 
like Robert Kiyosaki's uh, original uh, strategy um, back in the the nineties. When if you read any of his first books, the Rich Dad series, that was like his big uh, play was doing the the land contracts or the rent to own. Yeah. So shifting gears to a fire round, what is the best book that you recommend other than Rich Dad Poor Dad? I read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, I don't know how many times. So I got to throw that out there as, as one of the books uh, that has had a big impact on me. That, and then along with that, um, Andrew Womack has, a, um, I think it's a DVD series, that The Power of Your Imagination, that would be another one. And then I've got to say the old Hebrew scriptures, the Bible, when when the rubber really hits the road, 2008, 9, and 10, I was pulling that one out way more than anything else. All right. So what is your superpower? Unfortunately, Duke, I don't know if I have any superpowers. I wish I did. Probably my, my strengths, I would say, um, would be persistence. Um, I've had to pick myself off the ground many, many times. So persistence would be one of them. And secondly, I would say developing a skill set of encouragement of others as I, the, the company is growing and I have more and more employees. So I would say those would be my two strongest skill sets. All right. So what is the biggest lesson that you learned along your journey through business? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, I think the diversification, Duke, would be one of the biggest things. And then secondly, understanding that um, leverage is a double-edged sword and it has a great power to make money. But when things turn the other way, it, it can cut hard against me. So having proper balance in the leverage and then also realizing when things happen that I didn't have any control of, to stop kicking myself, stop beating myself up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. For the busy working professional who's working towards financial freedom, what advice do you have? I really like what you guys are doing. I like the idea of them being a limited partner. I think that there is just a lot of value in that for them taking people like yourself that are experts at this and leveraging and hooking their wagon to you or someone like that, a syndication. That concept makes a lot of sense for them. Absolutely. So as we wrap this up, how can people reach out to you? I would say just go to our website, and that would mdlbay.com, and that would be the best way to communicate to us. And um, I'd be love to hear anybody else what they're doing, and maybe there's some type of synergy between us. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Thank you very much. I'm very honored.